Assalamu alaikum. Welcome to Prophet Noah, where we're continuing on with Musa's Ark, with the segment called Musa's Ark. We're continuing on with the identity of Bani Israel as it relates to Prophet Moses, to Nebi Musa, alayhi salam, peace be upon him. So in where we left off, we were discussing how it's possible to read the Genesis account and see the corruption and the compromise, but also find a deeper truth within it, inshallah, that will help us to identify more accurately and assess more accurately who Bani Israel is or how we can read it in a practical manner for, for us to grow as individuals and as a collective, as Muslims, as believers. So in, this la in, in the last episode when we were discussing how we had a Pharaoh who then did not remember Nebi Yusuf. Um, he then enslaves Bani Israel. He enslaves the Israelites. For 400 years, they're enslaved. And this is going to lead up to Prophet Moses, to Nebi Musa. So in the... the what I would argue is that it's the, it seems like it would be the Pharaonic household and the Pharaohs you got to think who would change materials and for what purpose it's it's you know who's being depicted or who is trying to engage in trickery there's a long time effort like the liar the deceiver the one-eyed actually from everything that i've studied is is coming out of the pharaonic brotherhoods the cultic networks the possession cults those who are related to uh various threads from babylon from Rome, from Egypt. And, you know, there are some instances where we can see that they have corrupted the prophetic tradition uh, in order to prevent us from attaining enlightenment as individuals and as a collective and of being freed from the yoke of, of their slavery. Because the pharaohs, the, their goal is to, to own the world. And we see their symbolism all around, the one-eyed symbolism, the pyramidal symbolism. This is, all, this is all by design, and it's all related to, to magic workings and, and technologies. Um, so anyway, Bani Israel, like they are, they are, like, if we go back and we see that, that, imagine that the pharaohs, what they did is they projected the guilt of enslaving the people onto Nebi Yusuf by saying that this was the patriarch Father Joseph who enslaved the people. At very least, he enslaved all of the Egyptians. And according to some of the translations, it's described as the world. And this is, this is a very interesting thing. And I know that some of the scholars have, have tried to rebut this and said that that's problematic. But it also really relates to some of the context that we've dealt with historically as a human species. With, uh, with a parasitical, predatory um, group that is amongst us. So when we, when we consider... Um, the world coming into Egypt and then being enslaved. But then we flip it the opposite way. So they're enslaved to the Pharaoh, who then is claiming that, that it was actually Joseph who did it to the world. But now we flip it and we look at it from Prophet Yusuf. Now imagine the prophet is here and many Egyptians and outsiders from around the world come for food and as a prophet, he offers them this, he offers them shelter, he gives them some land, he gives them opportunities to live in the land, because they're gonna be small groups, but they're representing a diverse group of many different colors, many different backgrounds. They're coming in. He also has his family there, who will, because they're Ahobet, they will be spiritual leaders in the land. And they will be spiritual leaders of these people, because the thing is, when people gain benefits, oftentimes they look at, they look at an individual you know, who is, who is uh, you know, uh, a prophet as their savior. He just saved them from starvation. So they're looking at him. He's, he's, a, he's a spiritual master. They're looking at him. He's an enlightened being. They're looking at him as somebody to follow and to learn from and benefit from. So they take Baal with him. And he, he gives them shelter and protection, opportunity and benefits as a prophet, as a Nebi. Here within Egypt, he makes space for them. And they follow his traditions and they take his family line as being very serious. So they, they look at the Ahobet as, as spiritual masters and teachers, you know, who are all descended from Nebi Ibrahim, from Isaac, from Yaqub. And they're, you know, and then over the, the centuries, 
there, you know, imagine that there is a Pharaoh who comes who he does not like this Islamic Tawheed uh, and, 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 and practice of Islam within his lands. He wants to eliminate it. And at the very least, he wants to break the people who are there. So perhaps he exiles some, perhaps he keeps them, keeps them enslaved and tries to pervert the tradition by putting his, his agents within the community in order to cause dissension, to get them off track, to destroy the dean from within. So now we've got this, this taking place over the centuries, over 400 years, but the people are still looking at the Aho Bait as being teachers, as being descended from Yusuf and connected to Yusuf, who they honor and they respect and they admire. And so during this time, the, slave, the people are, they're, they're enslaved, they're humiliated, they're being downpressed and oppressed and tyrannized on a regular basis. Um, and then at a later point, obviously, they're being utilized for blood sacrifice. Um, but when it comes to, to this account of Bani Israel, just consider Bani Israel as being a world community, a world Muslim community. At a later point, I would argue that what happens is it would be as if our Muslim community looks to Aha Bayt as, as the leaders. And so perhaps look at the Twelve or Shia. And consider this, it would be very much like at some point, the non-genetic descendants, you know, the, the, the people who follow the Ahobate tradition, they identify with it as their own genetic disposition. So this world diverse community starts to identify with the, with the, the God and tradition of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob through Yusuf, through Joseph, right? Kind of mixing these together a little bit and hopefully we can come to to a, to a common clear vision inshallah that'll help us to understand what's going on or at least to think about it more more closely more carefully so this so now we've got at a future point at some point they are identifying even though they are not genetically descended from ibrahim alayhi salam they're spiritually descended from him and they they start to identify with him and this happens through conversion at later points as well where people who are not genetically descended from Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob begin to identify. And outside groups, they, they appreciate the traditions and they wind up identifying with it strongly. And so these would have been many dark-skinned members, maybe some light-skinned mixed in, but it predominantly would have been dark-skinned members of these families. Even, even Nebi Yusuf and later Nebi Musa, they look like the Egyptians and they fit in in Egyptian society. And we can see that from within the Quranic and the biblical texts. And so we've just got to we've got to read this, read this within context, within social historical context. And some people try to say, well, color doesn't matter, brother. Color blindness is nonsense and it's unhealthy because we need to read everything and appreciate. We, we are made different colors so we can appreciate one another and know one another through compare and contrast. And every group has some important pieces of the puzzle to bring to the table. So just consider that Bani Israel actually spiritually and symbolically represents all of humanity that's, that's, that's Muslim. This is a Muslim community. Now, it might have been a specific group that, oh, that, that developed historically for some time and had genetic con, uh, connections because we don't even see uh, we don't even see, like, say, for instance, a later Jewish development. We don't see the Jewish community begin to really, really close off until the time of Ezra, the scribe. And, and then also during the Roman times when Romans started to have a Christianized empire moving toward the Byzantine times where Judaism begins to uh, become exclusivist and, and, and kind of isolate themselves off and shut themselves off for, from conversion. But back then, it was, it was an Islamic tradition. And, and they were, they were, you know, there was a form of Salah. We can see this biblically over 30 times in the biblical texts. We see prophets and friends of Allah um, standing in prayer and pros put it prostrating. So we see many accounts of standing in prayer, bowing in prayer, prostrating in prayer throughout the biblical text. So it's very important that we consider Bani Israel as a very diverse world community, an ummah. A diverse Ummah early on and later we're going to see Musa begin to identify with them in their struggle and he sees the injustice of it and he actually winds up hurting some or you know hurting some or killing somebody who is harming somebody who's been enslaved and he sees this as an injustice and he's willing to put his life on the line 
and his reputation and his status on the line and have to go in exile. And then when he goes into exile, he further, he, Allah takes him on a path to show him his connections to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Peace be upon all of them. And so this is going to bring us to the next segment of the series, but just in the meanwhile, just consider that Bani Israel, oh, and by the way, just as, as far as if we're talking about the Jewish people, um, the Jewish group is a very, very diverse group of people. And even what I'm arguing automatically, it, it uh, includes the, the strong potential that they have many bloodlines, that many threadings from Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, especially those who had lived in the Middle East for, for long, long periods of time. And so we still see a very diverse group and then other influxes of people in into Bani Israel over many, many long centuries which makes it a world community in many respects, from many different perspectives. So we should read Bani Israel not just as an exclusivist community, but as an inclusivist worldly ummah that was a Muslim in a Hanif type of sense, and that eventually becomes, it's kind of like Aho Bayt, like, like uh, Shia, identifying genetically with Ahabate and claiming genetic status from practicing in the tradition and not just be sp being spiritually descended but also genetically descended so this is a possibility something we should consider so until next time assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh